Welcome to Energy Careers, a segment of the Energy Conversations podcast dedicated to exploring opportunities in the dynamic world of the energy sector. For 13 years, I've had the privilege of navigating this sector, and it has significantly shaped my professional and entrepreneurial journey. Join me as we uncover exciting pathways for those interested in making their mark in this exciting sector. Let's dive in. Welcome to another episode of the Energy Careers segment, a segment of the Energy Conversations podcast, where we explore opportunities for young people looking to participate in the energy sector by walking the journeys of energy experts that have participated in the Energy Conversations podcast. In this episode, we will be exploring the energy journeys of Nathan Fredericks, Dia Magadagela, Winston Yordan, Fezile Lamini, I'd like to kick off today's episode with Fezile, please. Fezile, could you share a bit about your energy journey? How did you get involved in the energy sector? What did you study and what has been your career path up to this point? So how I got into the, to this particular journey was, it was literally, I call it divine intervention. And it was a divine intervention because I saw something that we see every day. It was witnessing Omama get off a taxi. And as she got off this taxi, I knew in Richards Bay, where I was at the time, that she had to walk that particular last part of her journey. So that's when uh, everything, when it comes to first mile, last mile came came about for me. And I was just, I just, I just completed my undergrad. So I studied at the University of Johannesburg and I studied strategic corporate communications. And with that, that's literally the dawning of the, of, of, of the entire business. Literally trying to see how can I solve this first mile, last mile journey using micromobility, uh, as a as a solution and then obviously what what, what engulfs from that is business model innovation clean energy and transportation as a service so i had to look at it from moving not just people but moving goods you know how can we save energy in the process how can we make more make more money from that so it was me now trying to launch africa's first all electric um, e-hailing platform that's where it started and then but even when i when i started with my planning in that december 2020 2015, I had already started developing the entire business that I would have wanted to to develop. So over time, I've done uh, different studies such as energy and thermodynamics. It was a, it was an online course from Harvard, and I've done many other different learnings, writing research papers and research articles. So these things I've published them to also show showcase my understanding within the business environment, as well as uh, how manufacturing and innovation could be could be uh, propelled. Thank you so much. Very, very interesting journey that 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 you've been on, and I love that you you didn't necessarily start in the traditional STEM degrees that that people think you need to be placed in to be able to participate in the energy sector. Although there is an importance to them, I think it's good to show that diversity of of backgrounds. Um, and if you were facing, you know, you're facing younger you, Fazile, who is just entering or just beginning his journey. What is the one piece of advice that you would give him, taking into account what your journey has has taught you? First thing I'd say is Fazile, don't do it. <laughs> and I say this because, like, like again, I'm 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 representing people who look like me, mm. and because there's, I mean, I'm an I'm an anomaly within this particular sector. And like I said, it's not something I'm, I, I like. I like. I like saying, uh, especially being a black youth, being the only black that's doing this. It's not. It's not. It's not anything that I, 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 I like being proud of, because it just means that there's a socioeconomic uh, challenge that uh, that needs to be resolved. But the younger me, I would remind them that, um, unfortunately, you're a creator by nature. And by being a creator, you must know that everything that you're going to do is going to be arduous. It's going to be it's going to be challenged, and you're going to have to ensconce yourself and find a unique place that literally helps at least keep you going. Um, you're not wrong in what you're saying. You're not wrong in what you're doing. You're on the right path because now the rest of the world or the rest of the country is catching on. And but it's okay if you don't benefit immediately, because those. 
those lessons that come with being rejected by the likes of IDC, et cetera, for me, honestly speaking, I I appreciated it. So mm. always always keep on accepting uh, the rejection that you get because it allows you to carry on building yourself to become a better version of you. And that's what I've literally uh, learned over time. You know, I've, I've learned to master my business. I've, had to, I've, I've learned uh, to, to, to read all of these different policies and realize that, look, no one else is going to do it for you. So carry on doing things for yourself. I mean, at that time when I was just uh, 28th of December, 2015, when I saw Lea Mahama walking, it just hit me, said, this is what you need to do. And I also feel that um, I never thought I'd be doing what I was doing, to be honest. I thought I'd be working at some global multinational corporation uh, with a CMSA next to next to my name as a chartered marketer. I thought that would be the case, but that has not been the case. Um, entrepreneurship is also a calling. You know, you need to learn to accept it uh, when it comes. You know, I, I went into entrepreneurship not for self-enrichment. I did it because I can. And when you have that uh attitude that's what literally gets you gets you uh uh separated from the rest of society being an anomaly is fine being an outcast is fine being a black sheep is fine but at the end of the day you're doing something that is meaningful and you know um keep going don't stop um rather stop when the casket drops you know um but also don't forget where you come from do something about even those who do something for those who look like you, which is one thing I've done over time. You know, I've, I've I found myself uh, wanting to now create a fund for black boys, you know, because again, when you look at our country, statistically speaking, unemployment is rife. You know, those not, not even interested in looking for workers are rife. And society is so focused on uh, optics and not focused on sustainability. And that's why for me, like one of, one of our comments in the session that we had, I said greenwashing becomes the problem. And by creating something that benefits black boys is because they've been sidelined in any form of economic activity, you know, um, but keep going, you know, eventually you'll get it right. Eventually you'll be able to uh, emancipate people who look like you, you know. Um, yeah, I think just going off a bit of a tangent with that, I mean, I'm mentioning this whole black boys uh, and uh, 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 topic because it's something that sits close to me because society has such a high unemployment rate, right? We have so much crime that that takes place and who's actually creating it? It's a black boy. And we're not actually thinking of how to rebuild society from what it was uh, pre-1990. If you are a parent out there, and you're a mother, and you have a black boy as a black boy, that black boy is still going to face a lot of challenges. And I've been sidelined for things like that. And if we're not, if we're not uh, being, if we're not conscientizing ourselves in such a way that we actually are designing society to start including everyone, then we'll always have the same issues. It's going to be a never ending cycle, never ending red, red, red race. So, you know, um, I think one thing that's also saved me uh, that I would remind my younger self is that your pride is what will get you there. Because if you have no self-control, if you have no discipline, you will literally get lost in the ocean. And having that, that little bit of pride, as bad as it is in some instances, it keeps you away from what is bad out there. And you just have to keep your head down. Like I remember my dad once, my late father once said to me, when he dropped me off for my first my first day at, at, at Rhodes University, he said, you must make sure, because he, he, he was a doctor, right? he said to me, make sure you, you sew your scrotum onto this chair when you study. And it stuck with me. And then he also said, you must always make sure that you're wearing your work claps. So you know, like a horse has got these like work claps where you can't really see what's there, what's there. It's just focusing on where it needs to go. And uh, you just have to keep on doing it. Um, just know you'll be misunderstood, but that's okay. Wow, <laughs> very powerful. I think you know, especially what you're saying around entrepreneurship, and especially not even just entrepreneurship, but if your cause is, if you are called to do something that is beyond you, it is going to be hard. And I think 
we don't nobody tells you when you begin the journey and when you're in the journey you can constantly be left with oh my goodness why did I decide to do this I could really be in a cushy job but when you then get down and it's just you and you you're back to but if I don't do this there's so many people whose lives actually won't be better and yeah. I'm better placed to you know do the work that I do. So thank you very much, Fezile, for, for those insights and that advice. I think it's advice that we can all use and advice that we all we all need to be reminded of. And Dia, I'd like to I'd like to bring you into the conversation and hear more about your journey. Please could you share your energy journey? How did you get involved in the energy sector? What did you study and what has been your career path up to this point? Yes, sure. Um, so I didn't study anything in the energy sector. Actually, I studied a BCom in accounting sciences and I started my career as an auditor. So I qualified as a chartered accountant. I did some work in the development finance institution space, in the DFI space. And then I did some work in the mergers and acquisition space. But while I was there, I think what really came to the fore quite a lot was just this entrepreneurial spirit that that I had. And I was always kind of looking for um, solutions to problems and started many other businesses before um, I started Ever Electric with my partners. But where the idea came from is we just realized that there were certain pain points that that our prospective client was going to have. And initially it was the taxi industry, but now it's the logistics industry. We saw them as needing to decarbonize. And so we came up with this solution that would sort of help them to do that, taking into account all the challenges that exist in South Africa. I would just say to anyone who is interested in the uh, energy space, you know, we live at a time where information is 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 abundant and so you can really pivot your career to do probably anything if if not maybe brain surgery and i think how i i i teach myself all the time about the industry that i'm in i am live in conversations with like-minded people like we just did in this podcast i I'm, I'm i'm learning if it's a formal course and informal this talking to people that is how you see what else is possible out of sort of your, you know, your area of speciality. And you, I see it a lot even, I mean, in the business as well. We employ people who whose background is in like a, a BSc or they, they are chemists or they are industrial engineers, um, things like that, who have then decided to pivot their careers to the energy sector or to the EV sector. So it's really just about continuous learning. And, and if you're interested in something, immerse yourself in it. Perfect. Great advice. I think that's it. Um, continuous professional development is key. You have to read. You have to know what's happening in this industry because that's the only way you're going to be able to spot where the problems are because mm -hmm. the gap, you only understand or see the gaps by immersing yourself in, 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 in the sector. What would you, so let's say, Ndia, in, in, in in you are looking at younger you, you're just beginning this journey. What would be the, the, the advice that you would give her? Hmm. I would say, um, and it really relates to, to what I, I, I was saying about continuous learning. I think I would have shadowed somebody also who is in the in a similar industry. And I think it's tricky because I was is a new industry, but not trying to be an island as as you're trying to build this, you know, this this whole thing. I think it is important for for young people to put themselves out there and to look for mentorship and not to have to learn all the, you know, all the mistakes. Learn by making the mistakes yourself, kind of talk to other people. Also, not just, you know, specific to the industry, but specific to um, entrepreneurship, people who have succeeded before, uh, finding those people and, and actually just, you know, learning from them would, would have made life a little bit easier. I'm grateful for all my lessons. I think we, we have come a long way, but there are some lessons that I didn't have to learn myself. I could have learned from somebody else. 
So, so, so true. Because I think the reality is we have more than enough mistakes that we're making. Um, there's, there's really no need to make to, to make them all. Thank you very much, India. Nathan, if I could hear from you, please could you share your energy journey? How did you get involved in the energy sector? What did you study and what has been your career path up to this point? Yeah, so my journey has not been a, a traditional one. Um, <laughs> I actually have to start at the end um, where I am. Um, so, I mean, obviously, you know, at the IDC, you're exposed to quite a lot. Um, and I'm fortunate to, uh, where I'm sitting in this team called industry planning in the CEO's office. Um, this really opened the door for my involvement in the energy space. Um, my focus area, as I said previously, is automotive and new energy vehicles. And that industry is transitioning. Um, in terms of the product and then obviously the energy required to propel that product forward. Um, and being responsible for developing IDC strategy in the space um, and also by virtue of IDC's involvement in the just energy transition. Um, uh, I've been involved in, in developing um, and assisting uh, in, in the development of the just energy transition um, investment plan and implementation plan for the NEV chapter um, and working closely with the presidency's uh, project management unit and, and other stakeholders in trying to pull together um, those strategies. Um, so that's really my involvement in terms of the energy space. Um, but then again, um, the need for industries and value chain to decarbonize and to switch to alternative um, uh, means of energies, et cetera, basically means that a lot of us are in the energy space, um, just virtue of things like, you know, sustainability and um, industries having to produce the products they, they make today uh, with a, uh, wearing a slightly different hat. You know, think about sustainability and then the energy transition. So it's really cross-cutting. Uh, in a nutshell, um, how did I get here? So I, I'm a, I'm a chemical engineer. Uh, I studied a, a BTEC in chemical engineering from the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. Um, I actually started my working life working as an engineer, uh, working at Mintech, uh, which is a mining research and technology uh, company. Um, I worked for five years there in the space of nanomaterials and catalysis. Uh, where I was fortunate enough to actually practice chemical engineering uh, and uh, doing everything from desktop research to running demonstration plants to doing uh, technology, being responsible for technology transfer to markets, taking products to market, product development. So it was quite an experience. Uh, and then in my spare time, uh, believe it or not, <laughs> um, Engineering is, is actually quite an uh, eight to five job. You don't really take work home, but in my spare time, I decided to study uh, a BCom in economics uh, at UNISA, because uh, I was very fascinated and interested in economics. Uh, I had a love for it. I did some electives when I was doing uh, studying chemical engineering. Uh, so I developed a love for it. Uh, and then I, I, I decided to study for BCom in economics, uh, continued to, um, completed that and then studied for honors uh, degrees in economics as well, both at UNISA. Um, and then in the time I studied, was studying economics and working at Mintech, uh, uh, I think five years uh, into that career, I decided I needed a change. Um, and fortunately enough, and this is where luck comes in sometimes as well, uh, I got a call from a headhunter who is looking for um, business analysts which, uh, who was looking for um, engineers to join the IDC as business, business analyst. Um, the IDC has a, a program, a, a cadet program, uh, which runs for about 18 months and they were looking for candidates to join that program. Uh, I got a call, I went through the interview process and three months later, uh, I started at the IDC and that was about 12 years ago. <laughs> so yeah, very interesting uh, journey. Um, completed my my economics degrees while I was working at the IDC. Um, yeah, and I've been at IDC for 12 years and I've worked in many industries. Uh, funny enough, I started out in the uh, metals and transport equipment um, business unit, which was then back 
uh, responsible for looking at automotive as well. Uh, I worked in forestry and wood products. Um, I worked in the chemical products um, and pharmaceuticals value chain as well. Uh, and I spent about eight years working as a deal maker, project development manager at IDC. Um, and then within IDC, I moved around. Uh, I spent about uh, a year or so working in the research and in information department as an industry analyst. And I think that's where I got really exposure to the um, energy sector. Um, I wrote a paper on green hydrogen um, and that's really where I got exposed to the transition, uh, the new industries or sectors in the space um, and the opportunities it presents uh, for South Africa. Um, and I'm often fond of that paper I wrote because it really opened my eyes to, you know, the possibilities and the applications uh, for all of this new technology as well and the opportunities that come with that as well. Um, and then from there, um, I uh, uh, made another move within IDC to the industry planning uh, team as well. Um, yeah, so uh, I've, I've, I've worked in many uh, industries of value chains, et cetera. Um, so I've been fortunate uh, in, in that regard. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think your, your journey is actually... A, a really great example. And I think it, it, I don't know if it's Steve Jobs, there's the quote, I think that's been attributed to him that, you know, you connect the dots backwards when you're looking at your life. So seeing, and I love that you've started it at the end, but you can then see how all of this actually connected together to get you to, to this place. So it's really a beautiful journey. And I think highlights from it also is really following where your interests lead you, right? So the economics angle went on to open a whole other a whole other realm of work that you could be doing. But although your your primary degree also then opened up these opportunities, and that I'd, I'd imagine feeds into the work that you're doing. And and I guess also speaking to the fact that we need to maximize our time. I think a lot of us, you know, there's 24 hours in a day. And we're not really being accountable to ourselves in terms of how are we using these hours effectively to get us to a place where we can actually have the life that we want or we are able to participate in these opportunities. Because, you know, anybody else could have said, I have a full time job. I don't know where I'm going to study. Like there's so many other things that I could be doing. Whereas, you know, you saw the value of, of that time and, 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 and really maximized it. So thank you so much for sharing that. If I had to, if, you know, if you had to be standing in front of, let's say, Nathan 10 years ago and or, or 15 or however many years ago, um, and he's just beginning his career or he's looking at making this this transition or beginning the journey with the IDC, um, what what is the advice that 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 you would give him? Um. Well, I think the well the first advice I, I would give him is actually consider studying law <laughs> because lawyers are everywhere. You, you, always, you always need a lawyer. It doesn't matter which industry you work in. Um, you, you need a lawyer. Um, and lawyers uh, find themselves working in quite high positions in organizations as well. Uh, so, yeah, just being cheeky, um, I think that's the one thing. But no, really, I think, you know, um, uh, you know, in, in, in this professional space, you know, there are certain uh, pro uh, career paths or, or, or capabilities that are always required, you know, whether it's engineering, whether it's accounting, um, whether it's uh, uh, studying law, um, whether it's um, working well with people, uh, managing people and um, being effective communicators or communicator uh, in the working environment as well uh, and, and in, in general as well. Um, there are some core skills that you require. Um, so it's good to have the technical skills, but you also need to have these other skills as well. And then you essentially um, have essentially a black box of capabilities um, that you would use to um, to um, to really add value wherever you are, um, and 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 to 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 really um, you know um, uh, you know try to um, uh, 
fulfill your passions, you know? Um, there needs to be a drive behind anything that you're doing. Um, and that's why you need to always try to have an impact, um, whether it's um, in a professional life, but also, you know, you can have an impact uh, on, on other people as well. Um, and I think that's important um, to have that positioning. Um, I think in the energy space, you know, there's always some sort of specialized skills that's required. For example, I'm hearing there's a need for, you know, high voltage electricians, um, artisans, etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, um, it doesn't end there. You can always uh, have a base and then combine that with other skills, um, softer skills, business skills, et cetera, um, and really improve your own value proposition as well. Um, I think the one important thing, and all these two things, um, it's, it's, it's always good to speak to people in the industry um, and to get an understanding of what the job actually is, uh, what the industry is actually like, what is actually required, uh, because often you find is, you know, what you need to get in and then what the job is that you're actually doing on a daily basis, et cetera, um, uh, might not be the same. Um, and sometimes the requirements are quite high to get in, but the, the job is actually not that hard, um, for example. Um, and then the one thing that I wish I had was a mentor um, and, and a good mentor to speak about um, career um, issues around careers, uh, life skills, um, and a lot of the other things as well. Um, and I think at some universities, they provide that. Um, but you know, at other universities, maybe like distance learning universities, you probably don't have that um, uh, that's that service provided, et cetera. Um, but there are sort of mentors and organizations out there that provide mentorship as well. Um, and I think I would encourage young people to reach out to those organizations or try to get a mentor or someone that you can speak to that provides uh, some sort of guidance as well. Um, because you could be doing a lot and you could be doing, um, spending a lot of time moving in a certain direction and uh, trying to just um, acquire a lot of qualifications, for example, um, but it might not be the most efficient path. Um, you could be going in another direction and in doing less work and achieving the same outcomes. Um, so I think that's very well, uh, valuable as well. And then I think um, lastly, focus on communication. Uh, it's so important, um, and it's actually one of the higher level skills that you need in a working environment. Um, obviously, when you start out, you focus on the technical stuff, you know, and it's the you know it's the STEM, it's the maths and science, uh, it's, it's 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 the STEM skills uh, required. Uh, it's the technical stuff that you need to learn. Um, but when you get into the working environment, being able to communicate with people at different levels. Um, being able to communicate not just your knowledge and skills, but um, also being able to communicate um, uh, your thoughts, emotions, your ideas. Those sort of that sort of skill is actually very hard. People don't realize that, and being able to articulate your your those sort of things uh, effectively, um, and being able to communicate um, whether it's written uh, verbal communication, is is actually uh, quite important. Um, so I encourage uh, um, young people to, and particularly uh, young um, uh, university students, if they get the, the opportunity to go to um, sort of programs like the Toastmasters, for example, um, where uh, you, 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 you learn those skills um, and you can challenge yourself as well um, and, uh, yeah, and, and develop that capability as well. And then once you have that capability with the combination of the technical skills, um, and of course, you know, being able to work with people as well, um, sometimes uh, it's, it's come naturally to everyone, um, but being able to work with people, being able to work with teams, um, uh, and, and those, the combination of, 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 of capabilities, uh, will really put you in a very good position as well to, to work in this environment. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you've you've touched on so many wonderful points, and I actually find found it very affirming for my own journey. Um, because I think the reality is when we speak about our careers, we always think it's just a young person. But I think at any level of your career, wherever wherever you are, you've got to constantly be thinking about how do I grow, how do I develop. 
Um, and, and I love how you're touching about lawyers. I mean, I'm, I'm a lawyer and lawyers, you really do. You will find us everywhere, even on your podcast. Um, and, and, and I find that it is the kind of qualification that really does make you adaptable. Um, and you are able to slot into in, in, into any kind of sphere because the reality is the law applies everywhere. Um, but I also like the point that you're making in terms of the energy sector and the reality um, that, that you'd made that, that the point is it's a sector that cuts across so many. It cuts across all of our lives. It cuts across whatever it is that you're doing, whether you think you are involved in the sector or not, you actually are involved in the sector. Um, and I think also a, a, a key point that you've highlighted has been is communication and and I and I, I really I echo that I mean as a Toastmaster myself I found that participating in things like Toastmasters really does make you more conscious in terms of how are you communicating you are then being part of you know being these um and R counters so every time I end up listening to the to the episode I'm like oh there were so many ums I wouldn't have made it in a in a normal Toastmasters meeting so I think it it is about that it's about you know, broadly bringing in all the different skills that you have. And I love what you've said, a black box of skills, because you then don't need to be confined to a specific role or to a specific, uh, you know, position in an organization. Um, you're able to tap in and pull out of these skills so that you're able to live a career, live a life and, and pursue a career that that does fulfill you and that does speak to to your passions because we spend so many so many hours in our weeks um at work or doing the work of our you know doing what your labor requires you to do it, it really is important that you then find a space or be able to engage in work that then does speak to you so thank you very much for that nathan winston please could you share what your energy journey has been how did you get involved in the energy sector what did you study and and what has been your career path up until this point Oh, thank you. Um, I think the, the I started by studying physics, and I think this is a fundamental difference um, for me because when I when I chose to go in that direction is I was I had these crazy ideas about building a flying car, and ultimately the only way that I was going to actually learn how to do this because this was quite a big technical challenge was to go and study something like physics at university. And I felt that physics was a more generic thing. And once I got into that, I really started to, to really understand the energy landscape immensely, not just around the production of energy, you know, be it solar, et cetera, but how we use our energy and the efficiencies on how we use our energy and things like that. So I spent a, a good portion of my early life really writing energy control systems or energy management systems in furnaces and big industrial processes. So I spent a lot of time doing process control and, pro and working in the process environment. And slowly over time, I became more and more fascinated, I think is probably about the electric and the mobility side of things. And, and really that came to a head early in about 2002, where I started looking at designing an electric vehicle I started looking at solar technology and combined a few of those things and got into crazy things like racing solar powered cars and did a bit of traveling around the world to see what solar powered car technology was doing. And I, from that, I could see the thing about a solar powered car is that it's really difficult. It's actually not very easy to build a car that's powered only on the solar that is on the surface of the car. Because if you think about it, at very best, you've maybe got a kilowatt of power which means if the car is driving using that, it's got a kilowatt of power on the wheels, whereas most cars have got 50 or 60 kilowatts of power on the wheels. So it's a, a, the only way that that works is with an ultra, ultra efficient system. And those efficiencies um, really became fascinating to me and allowed me to sort of understand how electric cars would work and how the use of energy would work and how using limited things like solar technology and using that into batteries and with electric vehicles. So, so that really drove my interest was seeing how those efficiencies come together to bring really efficient tech. You know, if we look at electric cars, even if we took the dirtiest of, of coal burning power stations to make electricity, an electric car is still 30 to 40% less emissions than the cleanest of the fuel cars. You understand? And that's just because pure efficiency. An average electric car's electric motor is sitting at 90 to 95% efficiency, whereas the average petrol engine is sitting at about 15% efficiency. So that would mean that 15% of the energy in a petrol car turns the wheel and makes the car go forward. 
and 85% of the energy makes pollutants and heat and noise. Whereas in an electric vehicle, it's the other way around. 95% of the energy turns the engine or the motor and the wheels, and only 5% goes into making a bit of heat and, and noise, potentially. So it's that, and that efficiency difference is what makes electric technology so amazing. And when we start looking at things like solar and how we can bring the efficiencies from solar into that, it just suddenly makes so much sense. Why would we want to waste energy if we can take it and use it in an efficient process and drive that forward? Wow, that is quite quite an interesting journey. And you sound very passionate about it. And 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 it really seems like this work has has almost been ingrained into your your DNA. Um, but I want to take you back to you know. 20 years ago, Winston or a younger you, before you, you know, you got it, it you've became this version of you. And 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 I'd want to ask you, what is the one piece of advice that you know you would give to 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 younger Winston on his journey? So, so I, I really do believe that I would have told myself to just remain a surfer. I think that would have been probably a much a much nicer life. <laughs> and but but in all seriousness, I think as an entrepreneur, the one challenge I always had was was focus. And you know, over the years, I think when we first met, so when was that 2015, if I remember correctly, um, we as a company were doing maybe 10 or 15 different things. And when I speak to people and they say to me, oh, but you have to learn to focus, you know, to entrepreneurs. And I had a, a chat with Pablo Fatidis the one day. And he said to me, listen, you really need to look at how you can focus. In fact, the course that we were doing at the time was also teaching us about focus. And my argument was, well, investors don't focus. They have, you know, 20 different products and they invest into those and you've got a basket of products. And as an entrepreneur, I have a basket of products because I don't know which one is going to succeed. And I and because I don't know, because we are fairly highly innovative. So when you're working in really highly innovative areas, it's really hard to pick a successful tech. And, you know, we know what is the success rate, maybe 5% in general in the industry when it comes to, to tech and innovation. So that would tell me to have a guarantee of success. I need 20 items in my bag and I need to be pitching quite hard at all 20 of them to see if that's going to make it. In 2017, um, I, I, part of my company was acquired and one of the conditions of that was that we've got to focus and it it really became a very difficult thing for me at the time i in fact i wrestled for a long time well a long time probably a day but <laughs> in in an entrepreneur's world that's a long time <laughs> and i i wrestled for a while about whether this was the right deal because i'm now going to get punched into a corner and say you're going to have to pick where you go in Okay, and needless to say, you know, we went from a company that was building battery packs, installing solar systems, designing vehicles, vehicle management and control systems, uh, charging systems, you know, pretty much everything to only doing charging, to saying, let's put all of that vehicle, those vehicle dreams aside, let's put battery building aside, let's put building of solar and solar installations, let's put all of those aside, and let us focus purely on, um, thing, on that. The convincing thing that convinced me was the investor said, I don't invest if you don't do it. And in a way that I had to make peace with that and I and I did. And I was quite happy that I had made peace with it. Looking back, I see a lot of what people like when Pablo Fatidi spoke to me and said, you know, you do need to learn to focus because you're 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 splitting your efforts. Okay. I honestly didn't feel that. And I, I think the biggest thing I would say, and and that is that. I still just believe the people weren't able to convince me and the, it was because they really should have. If I look back on it, they should have been able to convince me that focus is better. And when I look at it back now as an entrepreneur, why would focus have been better? Well, I would have had a lot more money to spend on the things and I would have had therefore much more further improved their chances of success. Because I'm doing 20 things, I'm dividing my time and money in 20. Okay, if I'd have only done two or three things or one thing for that matter, then I could have put all that money into one thing and I, I know I would have had a better chance of success of that. I think that it would have been, even if I'd picked a bad tech, if I threw a lot more into it in the beginning, I would have been able to determine this is not going to be the one for me and move on to something a little bit faster. So again, I'm not somebody who says that entrepreneurs must change their minds quickly. I've done this over a 20-year period. 
Okay. So, but if I look back and I say, well, if I spent five years trying this and I couldn't get it right, then clearly move on to something else for the next five years. So, whereas I spent maybe 15 years chasing 10 different I things in that entrepreneurial journey. And when I picked one, we were successful. Okay. And I think you have a bigger chance of success if you're able to direct your effort and all of that. I also think it changes people's perception of you because now they're not just seeing you as this entrepreneur. They're seeing you as somebody who's trying to become an absolute driven expert in a particular area. And you tend to get better support for that. You get customers are more open to using you because you're not as distracted. So the best advice I could give myself would be to really convince me, the younger me, that I would, that I should have focused on something earlier. Now, what that something is, um, I wouldn't want to call it right now, because maybe if I'd have focused on building cars, I would have been more successful at building cars. Or if, but clearly we have focused on building charging systems and it's worked well for us in terms of how we've taken that to market and how we've built that market. And today we are seen as the absolute leader in the space. You know, there's, so we, we have the biggest network by far. We manage the most technology. We have the most experience and we've really opened up the market that the OEMs can bring the cars to the market. And we've done that in the last five or six years. You know, if you look at it from a, a thing, a tech, probably after the time that you and I have met. So you've seen me from those scatterbrain, non-focused periods, you know, right out to where we are today and what we're doing. Wow. And, and, and such a... Such a beautiful journey, and I, I've actually quite—I hadn't thought of it. It hadn't actually hadn't settled until you were saying it now. But it's been really—I've had front row seats, and it's been and really been beautiful to see. It's been and and I love how you're you're saying it. You know, I think the challenge is when there's so many opportunities, and especially as an entrepreneur, you're like, I need something to work. But then the risk is if I let go of this, will what will happen to that? And and, and, I guess, and I think the fear—it's it's the fear of letting go of the thing that you think would have worked. And then you also then contend with the fact that the thing you're left with, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean just as soon as you've let go of it, what's left is automatically going to flourish. So you then, you know, is that fear of oh, maybe I really did let go of the of the wrong thing yeah. because this thing is still giving me challenges. But but I guess it's it's all about honing in and for, and riding it out with with the chosen focus. And I think really, really wonderful advice. And 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 I think it like you're saying, it would be difficult to convince younger you because some of these things I know. Are, <laughs> it's you know, probably gonna be the biggest challenge, is you know hind, I mean, yeah, hind, hindsight is is always is always 2020. But but thank yeah. you so much, Winston, and thank you so much for for sharing so generously of your journey. Um really wonderful gems that that I think whether as an entrepreneur or somebody who's seasoned, it, there's definitely something that, that's really been left here for everyone. Again, thank you to our guests and, and to all of our listeners. Join us next time as we explore more journeys on energy careers, a segment of the Energy Conversations podcast. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into Energy Careers, where we explore the endless possibilities in the energy sector. Don't miss out on future episodes where we'll feature more inspiring journeys and insights on how to embark on your own energy career path. Subscribe now to the Energy Conversations podcast and unlock the door to exciting opportunities in the dynamic world of energy. Your journey begins here.